Hello everyone, Eric here, and welcome to another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. Hope all is well, and you are getting by as best you can. Just a reminder, all of my interviews can be found at my website, mostnotorious.com. I have neatly categorized the interviews for listening convenience. You can see the breakdown by state, New York, California, Illinois, Ohio, and Texas lead the way with the most true crimes, tragedies, and disasters covered on this show. Also, I've created a timeline on my website with a significant event from each interview, all listed in chronological order. I've got interviews organized by subject matter as well, the Old West, international crime, early American crime, 20s and 30s gangsters, Hollywood crime, etc., and you can look up an interview by an author's last name as well. All right, on to today's interview. I am very pleased to have Paul Bauer and Mark DeWidziak with me. Paul is a used and rare book dealer who co-authored the autobiography of Frazier Robinson, an American Negro League catcher. Mark DeWidziak is a returning guest to the show. I'm sure you remember our interview last year uh, that we did about the life and final hours of Edgar Allan Poe. That book, by the way, The Death and Life of Edgar Allan Poe, was very fittingly nominated recently for an Edgar Award. So they are here today to discuss the award-winning book they co-authored together called Jim Tully, American Writer, Irish Rover, Hollywood Brawler. The paperback version of the book has just recently been published. Paul, welcome to the show. Mark, great to have you back. Thanks. Good to be back. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So how did you come together to work on this book? And what was the research and writing process like? Well, that that starts with Paul. So I'll let Paul begin this because it really does begin in his shop. So Paul, how did we get into this? Good things, I believe, happen in bookshops. And uh, I have a bookshop in Kent, Ohio, and I had uh, one of my regular customers came in. This was sometime in the early 90s and asked for a copy of Jim Tully's uh, book, The Bruiser. And I had never heard of The the Bruiser. I had never heard of Jim Tully. And he pointed out that uh, Tully was considered the father of hard-boiled fiction. So I was a a bit taken aback because I was going through a big thing at the time of reading the Black Mask writers, of reading Hammett and Chandler and Kane. And I'd never heard of the guy. Then I really felt bad. When he said, you know, he lived in Kent for a number of years. I, I, I can't believe no one ever, why am I just now hearing about this? So I pulled one of the standard reference books uh, off the shelf. And it's the only entry, really virtually the only thing we could find about Tully initially. And I called my friend Mark Widziak then at the Beacon Journal. And I thought certainly uh, Mark will know something about Jim Tully. And, and he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I was working at the Akron Beacon Journal at the time, so I went back into the area of the newspaper called the Morgue, and that's where you store uh, your files, a dead copy, basically. So I went to see if we had a, a, a file on Jim Tully, and not only did we have a file on Jim Tully, it said former Beacon Journal reporter on it. And it had turned out that not only had he been in Kent, But he had worked for a brief time at both of the Akron newspapers, uh, had uh, failed attempts to be a a newspaper reporter. So it was very serendipitous. Everything seemed to be like Tully was right there for both of us in our backyard. And uh, there was another uh, bookshop in in town called the Bookseller. And I went by there and I asked them if they had any Jim Tully on their shelves. And they did. They had one book called Shanty Irish, which was his uh, sort of novelistic memoirs of his 
very boisterous Irish American family. And uh, I got the book, I took it home and I read it. And I've said this before, I, I really don't have a better way to say this. Telly's writing just took the top of my head off. I had never read anything like this before. And I too uh, was very fond of the hard-boiled school of writing. I had read uh, a lot of Dashiell Hammett. And Tully's writing, it, it is hard-boiled. And he he does write like a jackhammer. He's got a very staccato style of, of short clip sentences. But he also has this uh, almost kind of uh, Irish mystical poet side of his his writing. So he puts things in ways that no other writer would ever ever put them it is an extraordinarily distinctive writing voice and it cannot be confused with anybody else so paul and i at that point set out to read all of jim telly's works that we could get our hands on and this is pre-internet so we are basically searching uh, used shops and things like that and we are gradually building up our tully library and we found um 14 published books. And I think it took the better part of the summer to find uh, all of the books, but we've just became more and more intrigued by this writer. And we start to patch together what we can biographically. And somewhere around uh, the fall, we decided we would write the biography of Jim Tully. And uh, it was a it was a decision made largely on faith, because even with everything we knew at that point, we didn't know much and we didn't have much to go on. We didn't know we had enough to actually support a biography. And then something happened. And um, this will switch back to Paul now, because something happened which gave us not only enough to support the biography, but more than enough. So my research was that I'm in Kent, Ohio, so I would go to the Kent State University Library uh, to work on Tully, looking really just spinning reels of old newspapers, looking for his name to show up in either the Akron or Kent papers or the Cleveland Plain Dealer. And one of the librarians was sort of interested because I would be there night after night going through this, uh, all these files, asked what we were doing, and I this, I'm looking into Jim Tully, and he looked around, and again, as Mark said, this is pre-internet, well, he located Tully's papers at UCLA, and that was our big break. Uh, we immediately uh, made plans to somehow get our way out there to the special collections and go through that uh, 120, 30 boxes. When we got to Los Angeles and UCLA, the boxes uh, we that were called up and brought to us we saw had not been uh, open. No one had looked at these since they were donated by Tully's widow in, uh, I don't know, the 40s or 50s after after Jim died. Uh, and it was just a treasure trove of, of Americana, of literature, of Hollywood history, of crime history, of from Jim's life on the road as a, uh, as a hobo. It was just an amazing collection and in no order whatsoever. It took a, a long time to sort of for us to take notes on all this and then to get this in some sort of order and then be able to write uh, the narrative that we wrote in the biography. Wow, impressive. Yeah, gosh. So let's go back to Jim's beginnings. Could you tell us about his family, his growing up years? He was born in 1886 in um, uh, a little town called St. Mary's which uh, is in Auglaise County. And Jim's uh, folks were all Irish immigrants. His grandfather, Hugh, had been a lace peddler in the South during the Civil War. And uh, then his son, James Tully, was uh, a ditch digger, was a, your classic ditch digger. And if you were Irish and uh, you were a good ditch digger, in Auglaise County at this time, you did not lack for work. And uh, Paul, what was the reason for that? Well, the, this this part of Ohio was not settled for a long time because it was it was pretty much mud. It was uh, very low lying ground. There was water. There were mosquitoes everywhere. And for it to be settled, they had to have uh, the, it needed to be drained. And so they would hire uh, often Irish immigrants to go and dig these canals. 
and drain the land. So that's what uh, both Jim's father and grandfather did. They were they were ditch diggers. They they drained uh, the, the land in Auclays County. So Jim's life, uh, the first six years, um, were relatively happy ones. He had this large Irish family, and they were they were they were poor, but they were country poor. So the kids didn't have shoes, but no one in the area had shoes. And it was a fairly happy existence, although impoverished. Uh, that all changed when Jim's mother uh, died in childbirth uh, in 1892. Jim was, she was in her 30s. Part of the problem was that uh, Jim had been told, uh, the kids had been told, don't give her anything to drink by the doctor. For whatever reason, Jim gave her a glass of water and she died shortly thereafter. And he always blamed himself for that. Um, it was not known what to do with the kids. The father was off doing ditch digging jobs and he was somewhat detached from the kids in many ways. So the parish priest uh, decided it would be best for Jim and his brothers anyway to be go to the to be sent to the Catholic orphanage in Cincinnati where Jim spent uh, several years. He learned to read and write there. Um, he learned uh, an important thing for Jim, which is they had a Monday program where they uh, had to recite back the sermon from the priest from the, the previous day. And it really taught Jim to become a great interviewer, which was became really part of his life later as he, uh, as his writing career developed. Eventually he was simply aged out of the orphanage and there was nowhere else for him to go. And he ended up uh, on a farm in Ohio working essentially as an indentured servant. Uh, he stayed there as long as he could stand it about a year uh, it was a horrible existence. He did not have warm clothes, and he would go about his farm chores in the winter with thin overalls stuffed with newspapers, including one of the winters in Ohio that was famously called getting down into the minus 20s. So Jim escaped. He went back to uh, St. Mary's, where he kind of hung around uh, the railroad tracks and started hearing stories from hobos and railroad workers. And keep in mind, Jim, at this young age, had not seen much other than St. Mary's the farm raid work, and the orphanage. So these stories that were coming back about the world out there were really intriguing to him. And so he decided he would, uh, at the age of 14, he would hop a boxcar and get out of town. Uh, he returned for a while, worked again in St. Mary's. He worked in a livery and a restaurant and some other things. Most significantly at this time, he worked uh, as a link heater in a chain factory where he met uh, Charles Makeley who uh, Dillinger fans may know as one of the members of the Dillinger gang. So he and Charlie Makeley hung around. Uh, they both decided that they could not stay in St. Mary's forever. Ever. Uh, they spent a couple of days, um, they, they rode the trains down to along the Howe River, where they spent a couple of days swimming in the river. Uh, Jim stayed in Cincinnati, and Charlie Makeley headed off to California, eventually forming his own gang, and then later famously hooking up uh, as part of the Dillinger gang. Yeah. Just to remind listeners who recognize the name Charles Makeley, I did an interview with uh, Dillinger historian Ellen Polson a few months ago, and it was all about Charles Makeley, Harry Pierpont, and John Dillinger uh, getting captured in Tucson, Arizona. And M Makeley's name has come up multiple times over the years on this show. But I, I do want to talk a bit about Jim Tully's time on the road as a hobo. He was considered a road kid when he hit the rails. What's a road kid? And how does a road kid differ from a run-of-the-mill hobo? Well, a road kid is sort of like a junior hobo. As Jim said, they were very rough, tough breed, and you had to be uh, in order to defend yourself uh, from all manner of threats that were on, that that was that you were on the road, and he was very always very quick to say that he was not a hobo in the true sense that he'd been a road kid. You know, it's interesting because there there are these like increments of six years with Tully. You know, the first six years, as Paul said, were happy years, and they were the the, the childhood years, and then he's got six years in the orphanage. It's it's, it's another six years where it, it's almost like six years of imprisonment, and he doesn't really see the outside of the orphanage. And then he has those couple of years where he's just kind of figuring out what to do. But then guess how many years he spends on the road? Six years. So 
Tully, I think, thought that the two key decisions he made as a young man was the first was to break away from St. Mary's, Ohio, and discover the world out there. And you had to make the break. You know, there were a couple of tentative times where he hops uh, a freight and tries to get out. He comes back and then finally he does. And then the second big decision uh, and the second hardest thing he does is quitting the road. The road becomes addictive. It becomes a way of life. And as hard a way uh, of living it is because there was hundreds of ways a hobo or road kid could be killed. He has to, and and a lot of people are telling him that he has to get off the road. It's not a long life. You got to get off the road. Well, one of the things he does as as a road kid is whatever city he's in, he finds the public library because the public library is one of the very few places where you can stay warm and the police are not going to move you on. So he becomes what also is called a library bum and he gets to read. Uh, it's it's sort of his education, his true education, not only on the road, but also in these libraries where he is discovering all of these great writers who are going to fuel him with the de- desire to write. And <laughs> it's kind of remarkable that Tully ever became a writer. You know, he comes from mud poverty. He comes from this background of Irish immigrants and ditch diggers he's on the road, but along the way, there are all these links, like the, the chain that he learned to make as a, as a link heater. There are all these links which you build the chain as to what made him a writer. His father was a reader and had a little library. That influenced him. His grandfather, Old Huey, was a great storyteller. And from him, he sort of learned the value of a good story, well told. Even the nuns in the Catholic orphanage encouraged him to read and read out loud. And then the, on the road, as he's on the road and he's, he's talking to librarians and they're making suggestions to him about, you know, who he should read. His sister, Virginia, for some reason, thinks he should be a writer. So he's got this dream that's sort of building. It's, 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 an, it's an improbable dream that this guy is ever going to make himself into a writer. But he quits the road because he has picked up one skill. And that is working in a chain factory. So when he decides to get off the road, he does it in a town where there is both a public library and a chain works. And Paul, that town was? That was in Kent, Ohio. That's that's he came here because of the chain works. I I want to go back just a minute to what Tully's road years, what he was doing was criminal. Some places in the deep south were particularly not hospitable to hobos. Uh, Tully noted that Mississippi had vagrancy laws where uh, an officer was given $2 and a half for every vagrant he captured live. Then you had to work it off at 20 cents a day. You can do the math. You could be there for months, up to a year. And if you damaged property or they had to issue you clothing or or, uh, shoes, you had to pay all that back. So if you got nabbed for vagrancy, particularly in the South, especially in Mississippi, uh, you're going to be in a chain gang for, for months at a time. So there was always uh, danger and the risk of arrest uh, as he traveled back and forth across the country all those years. So I think he was really uh, ready at that point to get off the road when he came to Kent. Uh, he began working here as a boxer. That was the one skill he had picked up in the box cars was being able to defend himself. Uh, he worked here for, as a uh, tree trimmer. Um, he worked briefly as a journalist, but most significantly in Kent is where he really began to write. And I think he realized uh, with the encouragement of the town librarian that his years on the road and the things he saw needed to be put in print. And he uh, then set himself to write those things down. Ultimately, uh, those became the books for which he became famous. He was uh, married in Kent. He drifted out of Kent with his young family uh, doing a tree trimming job. He he was in um, uh, Waukegan, Illinois, which was uh, the site of a famous uh, poisoning case. It's worth talking about, particularly for listeners of this show. So uh, in 1916, in Waukegan, a man named E.O. Lambert 
uh, was in Lake Forest, is irritated when his daughter in February did not return home from high school. Uh, so you can imagine the panic set in for Lambert and his wife. They were up all night. Their girl did not return home. So uh, Lambert and a neighbor set out to find to try and find what happened to her. So they went to the railroad station, the train station near a place called Helms Woods. They found tracks in the snow, one set leading to what became they found was her body and her books, and one set of prints, uh, footprints leading away. Uh, police determined quickly that Marion had died of cyanide poisoning, and suspicion immediately fell on her former boyfriend, a University of Wisconsin junior named William Orpet. And uh, there were howls for Orpet uh, to be brought to trial and convicted. Uh, the trial went on uh, for several weeks. Tully was in town working at that courthouse uh, with a tree trimming job, uh, but he started hanging around the courthouse. And Tully was, if nothing else, always good copy. And reporters would turn to Tully to get his sort of man in the street opinion of what was going on with this murder case. Uh, they would repair after the uh, the court session to a local brewery. Tully was always available for an interview. And for Tully, it was really an important thing that he, he learned how to deal with the press. He learned what they wanted to hear and how to give them what they wanted to hear and how, in turn, perhaps to get what he wanted back from them. In the end, Orbit was acquitted. So the question then becomes, it wasn't suicide, apparently, and it wasn't murder, what killed Marion Lambert? So a crime writer named Otto Eichenschimmel considered that Marion Lambert had this plan that her boyfriend had broken up with her and he had a fiance and she wanted to bring him back. So she arranged this meeting in the woods. She had taken some cyanide from home and in a very dramatic flair, touched the cyanide to her tongue. Unfortunately, that was a lethal dose. Uh, she expected a warm embrace and a pledge of eternal fidelity from the boyfriend. Instead, she had the taste of bitter almonds burning in her mouth, began salivating, waves of na nausea, vertigo, confusion, and then she was dead. So it was uh, really an accidental death, but it was uh, a huge case uh, in that area back in the teens, the Herbert Lambert uh, murder case, or, or poisoning case, really. So uh, Tully eventually settled in Hollywood. He met, uh, began writing there with his young family in tow. Uh, and the big break of his life came when he was introduced to Charlie Chaplin. And I will let Mark talk a little bit about Chaplin. And we should say that even before he meets Chaplin, um, he for 10 years, he carried a manuscript with him during this time. And it's a a semi-autobiographical novel called Emmett Lawler. And uh, he manages to get this published in 1922. So this is kind of the, the moment of arrival, if you will. He, after all of these years, after all of these privations, uh, the boxing ring, the, the, the chain works, all of these things, he has made himself into a writer. He's actually done it. And the book is, is published by Harcourt. And uh, it's not a big success. It, it, it's wonderful that he has, has realized his dream and become a writer, but he, he still needs to make money. He still has a family, a, a wife and two kids uh, to feed. And it's at this moment that he's at a party and um, a fellow by the name of Paul Byrne introduces him to the reigning star of the silver screen, Charlie Chaplin. Now, Charlie Chaplin is still a household name. He's still an iconic figure, but Paul Byrne isn't. And that's kind of too bad because Paul Byrne, he, he, he is kind of uh, ubiquitous in, in Hollywood in the 1920s and into the 30s. He, he is uh, a studio executive. And when he finally gets to MGM, he's going to rise very rapidly and basically be the, the right-hand man to MGM's boy wonder head of production, Irving Thalberg. So uh, Burns, a very important man. He's also a very soft-spoken, very uh, learned man. He is um, round-faced, short, has a receding hairline. So not a very imposing figure, but he becomes one of Tully's best friends. And Paul Byrne does him an enormous favor right now by introducing him to Chaplin because Chaplin takes Tully on 
as a sort of catch-all writer working at Chaplin Studios on La Brea. And for uh, about a year and a half, Tully is working with Charlie Chaplin and observing Charlie Chaplin up close. And it's kind of interesting because Chaplin's screen character is the little tramp. And Tully's the genuine article. Tully really was a little tramp. And um, it's during the time that Chaplin's making one of the films that's uh, considered one of his masterpieces, which is The Gold Rush. So he's not only observing Chaplin up close, he's observing Chaplin at a very crucial period in Chaplin's career. And Paul Byrne is going to later go on. We might be getting a little ahead of ourselves, but we might as well dispose of this now and dispose of Paul Byrne at the same time. (laughs) <laughs> um, and <laughs> because he's going to become one of the great unsolved murder cases in Hollywood history is that in the early thirties, he's going to marry Jean Harlow. And, uh, shortly after he marries Jean Harlow, he is found dead. And the MGM people are the first on the scene. And it, the, the, the popular speculation is that they staged the scene that they staged the scene to look like a suicide and that they left behind what seemed to be a suicide note. And the suicide note uh, suggested that Byrne was impotent and could not consummate the marriage and that out of this shame, he shot himself. Now, Tully didn't believe that at all. Uh, There was an ex-wife who may have not been an ex-wife at the time, Dorothy Millette, who had been a struggling actress and had been married to Paul Byrne and apparently had never been divorced from Paul Burr and she had been in town at the time. So one of the, one of the, the, the guesses is that she, she killed Burn, uh, and then killed herself a, f- a couple days later. And, but this is an unsolved mystery. This is, this is, this has continued to be an unsolved mystery. Uh, and Tully su- suggested he knew the real story in, in letters to H.L. Mencken he uh, who became his uh, sort of literary mentor, the sage of Baltimore, the, the the reigning literary critic in the country. He told Mencken that it had more to do with Harlow's family, uh, and and the, that she was a gold digger. The the, the stepfather was uh, notorious, and he suggested that the suicide had more to do with the humiliation of that than anything else. But that was his theory. And again, he here he is at the heart of yet another famous murder case. In this case, a a Hollywood murder case that we're still arguing about. And and just one of two that Tully became involved with, the other being Thomas right. Ince. Uh, so and, Ince, and, and, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, no, you go. You, you take it, Paul. That's fine. So Ince, uh, Less than two weeks after his 42nd birthday, Ince really was probably the person who who formulated the studio system in Hollywood. Uh, he also did some writing. Uh, some of the uh, there were some silent films that Ince was involved in, uh, but he was kind of a, an important figure. So he was out on William Randolph Hearst's 280 foot yacht, the Oneida, when he mysteriously died. It was a weekend party. There was a jazz band. People invited by Hearst. Hearst's mistress, Marion Davies, was there. The writer, Eleanor Glynn, was there. Luella Parsons was on board. And not much else can be agreed on except that Ince died. He died on board. He died after they got back to shore. There's no uh, clear evidence of what it was that killed him. It could have been uh, or even ideas that he was shot accidentally by Hearst, who was aiming for Chaplin because he thought Chaplin was having an affair with Marion Davies. Chaplin denied even being on board this boat. So the, the stories are just crazier and crazier as these, they, they're sort of an information vacuum and the gossip begins. So what killed Ince? Well, uh, it, Tully was hired by Ince's widow to write the official biography. Uh, he worked for a while on it. Uh, he was paid for it. And then, um, Apparently, he was required to turn in all of his material, and nothing ever was heard of it. It's not clear what exactly it was. This manuscript never surfaced. We would have loved to have seen it in his archives at UCLA. But probably uh, Tully's feeling was that Hearst, there was bootleg liquor on board, and that probably was what killed Ince. 
And uh, Hearst was so um, opposed to getting bad publicity that he hushed all this up. But it was probably nothing more than bad, bad liquor that killed him. But it's still not known for sure. And uh, we would love to find this manuscript, but I, I don't think any copies have survived. That was Tully's Life of Thomas H. Ince, uh, which was to was finished yeah, in 1925. And it's even listed in, in as a forthcoming book in, in the front of one of his other books. So we kind of figured we might find that manuscript. We found uh, unpublished manuscripts uh, by the dozen in those papers, but we did not find the Ince book. But it, it is because because no uh, Hollywood mystery, I think, is more surrounded by speculation and scandal than the the Ince death. And I think one reason is because it was hushed up and there were so many conflicting reports. You can see reports that uh, he died on the yacht. He died in the hospital. He died at home. He died two days later. He died a week later. There's all of this, and there's so many uh, theories and counter theories. But one of the reasons Jim's theory about it being bad booze that got him was uh, some people said that that he died of either a, a, a peptic ulcer or indigestion. I'd, I've never heard of indigestion actually killing very many people, but those were two of the things that sort of that he was carried off the yacht. And if that's true, if it had been, that, that could have really matched up well with the same symptoms of bad booze. And this was not too long after the Fatty Arbuckle case. And everybody was in Hollywood was super afraid of scandal. If it had been known that there was drinking going on this yacht, that could have created a firestorm of extraordinarily sensationalistic reporting. And Hearst didn't want any part of that. Uh, Eleanor Glenn later said that everybody on the yacht was sworn to secrecy, but she didn't say why they were sworn to secrecy. Well, a very good reason might have been uh, the presence of alcohol on the yacht. And if that is what killed Thomas Ince, and Tully did believe that that's what it was, that would make a lot of sense. But in the cover-up, it left a lot of room for people to gossip. And boy, did they gossip. There is no end. And then uh, Chaplin... Some a valet who said they saw the body being carried off the yacht saw a gunshot wound, and that rumor spread like wildfire. And so many people believe that that it was Hearst that 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 killed him, and that there had been a gunshot. That story was repeated all the way down with the time Orson Welles did Citizen Kane. That was the story that was told Orson Welles. He later told that story to Peter Bogdanovich, and that story exists to, to today. So here's Tully at the heart of two of the greatest Hollywood mysteries, the death of Thomas Ince and the death of Paul Byrne. Both Byrne and Ince, sadly, if they're known for anything today, are by how they died or the speculation on how they died, not for what they did. And that's kind of a shame. In some ways, Ince even more because Ince was the pioneer. Ince made more than 800 movies. And he was a screenwriter, a producer, and a director. He was amazingly prolific. And he, as Paul said, he was extraordinarily instrumental in creating what we now know as the studio system, how you make a movie. He was the first one to insist on a complete shooting script for a movie, for instance, not just an outline, not just some scenarios, but a full proper shooting script. So a lot of the techniques that people use to make movies today were because of Thomas Ince. And he's completely lost. If, 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 if again, if, if a Hollywood fan of any kind knows the name Thomas Ince, it's because, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he 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 got shot on on Hearst yacht, right? And that's where the discussion always begins and kind of ends with Thomas Ince. Yeah, Bogdanovich's movie was was called The Cat's Meow. That's right. Just in case mm -hmm. anybody listening wants to uh, check it out. Exactly so, right. So what we have with Tully, really, it's almost he has two uh, almost separate uh, writing careers going on. We have the Hollywood stuff. Uh, we mentioned uh, doing this instinct, but he wrote tons of freelance uh, work on Hollywood, 
on the various stars in Hollywood. That was pretty lucrative. That paid the bills. But he was also turning out these books about his his years on the road. Uh, so he had these two separate careers. The the books were getting uh, were well received, uh, sold rather well. But the Hollywood stuff really, I think, paid the bills consistently. He was he was just constantly churning out things for photo play and all the all the movie magazines. So he had this sort of two pronged uh, writing career going on. He was really the first to write about Hollywood, who was not employed by the studio. He was the first independent uh, writer. Therefore, he was seen as sort of uh, pretty rough on some of these stars. Probably no one, no one rougher than on uh, John Gilbert. And I will, I will let uh, Mark tell you the John Gilbert story. Yeah, you know, today you read what he wrote about uh, the Hollywood uh, people, and and again, he was not constrained by the puff pieces being put out by the studios or anything like that, or the the, the publicity controlled by the studios. He was. Um, he was nicknamed the most feared man in Hollywood. He was also called the most hated man in Hollywood. And, you know, Paul and I went back and we read these pieces and they seem pretty tame by today's standards. We were like, really? <laughs> they were getting upset about this? But he wrote a series of profiles for the, the, the big magazines back east in New York. And um, there was one he wrote about John Gilbert, uh, the matinee idol, the silent screen matinee idol. And even by today's standards, it was pretty rough. Um, apparently, Tully got most of his information about John Gilbert from Lon Chaney, who was one of his closest friends. And Chaney had worked up a, a really strong dislike of John Gilbert. So the piece that was finally published on Gilbert was so strong that when Gilbert read it, he threw up. And he festered about it. And you got to remember that uh, Valentino dies uh, 1927 and Gilbert is kind of positioned as being the heir. He's going to be the, the next great sex symbol, leading man matinee idol uh, of the screen. And it doesn't really work out that way. And then the talkies start to come in and there's this, this rumor that, that Gilbert's voice was very high pitched. It really wasn't that bad, but, Gilbert had a way of making enemies. He had a way of drinking at the wrong time. So by 1930, his career is is really gone off the tracks. And um, he walks into the, the Brown Derby, the famous Brown Derby restaurant in Hollywood. And there, seated in a booth, a short fellow, stocky fellow with flaming red hair, wild tousled red hair, it's Jim Tully, the guy who wrote this awful piece that he associates with his career going south. And he makes a very big mistake. He goes for Tully. And uh, he, he, he storms towards Tully uh, with blood in his eye. Somebody shouts out to Tully, you better get on your feet. A phrase not uncommonly heard in a bar. <laughs> and <laughs> Tully gets up in a boxer stance. He immediately jumps up and he's, he's ready to defend himself. And uh, Gilbert throws two wild punches at Tully, misses with both. Tully steps in. He's a bo he'd been a boxer. He steps into the gap and he, he snaps a, a right and knocks out Gilbert out cold. And um, this is a humiliation at a time when John Gilbert does not need another humiliation. But the police are called. And um, they ask what they always ask, which is, you know, like, well, OK, what happened? And Tully tells them, well, I'm not really sure. This guy came at me waving his arms. He was making such a breeze. I, I was afraid he was going to give himself a cold. So I put him to sleep for his own protection. <laughs> and, and it's kept quiet for a while. Tully didn't want this to get out. He didn't want to be seen as a primitive and a, and a, and a, a, a bruiser who this guy who was, he want he was trying to be known as a writer. And, uh, it did leak out eventually. And when it does leak out, it's humiliation on top of humiliation for Gilbert because the headlines all say, you know, matinee idol failure with fists, Tully victor in one round knockout. It's, it's, it's just awful. And Tully was and, a little um, guy. Tully was a little guy. He was, yeah. yeah, he, I mean, he had boxed professionally, but he was not a big guy, but uh, he took care of John Gilbert. He was a lightweight. Yeah. Yes. He was a lightweight. And, um, 
But uh, Louis B. Mayer, who was not particularly fond of John Gilbert, knew the price of good publicity when he saw it. So he decided he would rush Jim Tully into John Gilbert's next movie, which was called Way for a Sailor. It's released in 1930. Now, 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 Gilbert and Tully patched it up. You know, they, they, there was not like any kind of long-standing feud. Gilbert saw the wisdom in, in, in just sort of patching it up with Tully, and so they throw John Gilbert into this, this movie, which is basically about three sailors on leave, uh, and and the the three sailors are played by John Gilbert, Jim Tully, and then the third sailor is one of Tully's best friends. The third sailor is Wallace Beery. So I think the idea was that they could beef up Gilbert's uh, He-Man image if they surrounded him with Wallace Beery and Jim Tully. And um, the movie is not very good. It was directed by Sam Wood, who would later go on to direct the Marx Brothers in A Night at the Opera and then do Goodbye, Mr. Chips. So it was directed by Sam Wood. It's an early talkie. Uh, it is not a very good movie, but we like this movie a whole lot because Jim Tully's in it, and you can see how he, what he sounds like, what he, what he, how he moved, what he looks like, and um, it, it again, it's not a very good movie, but but boy, is it a lot of fun for us because um, it, it is basically just a romp about three sailors on leave. We we kind of skimmed over this. But he had a decent career as a boxer, right? He he made friends with Jack Dempsey. He was a he was a good boxer. He he really was. I think in everything in his boxing career, in his writing career, he was a survivor. I mean, he had to be from his years on the road. And uh, anything he could do to survive and and live to fight or to write another day, he would do. So yeah, he knew uh, he knew Dempsey when they were in Salt Lake City, uh, before Dempsey was known. He was uh, he boxed really all over the Midwest and as far west as uh, San Francisco. Uh, he finally got knocked out once, and I think that was put in his mind that he he had been around enough um, punch drunks, and he knew that he couldn't do that forever. Just as he had decided he couldn't be on the road for other that it would ultimately kill him, he realized boxing too would eventually kill him. Writing would kill him, but it would be a, a slow death <laughs> and a slow and somewhat impoverished death. And that's what he chose. Uh, during his struggles as an aspiring writer, he, he had other writers that he looked up to and he was extremely determined when he set his mind on meeting one of them and, and he found a way to do it. He met everyone from the hobo writer, Josiah Flint to Jack London, to Upton Sinclair. That's right. And, and, and Jack London is kind of the early hero, I think, because London had been a writer of the road. Tully always particularly admired writers who had had experience on the road of some kind. And so Jack London was sort of held up to him. I, I, more than one librarian said to him, well, look, Jack London could do this. You can do this. Um, I think he later became disenchanted with London. Uh, I don't. Th I think later on he writes somewhat disparagingly about London when he starts to make it as a writer. But yes, there are all of these various writers that he he does seem to meet. Uh, but that's true about almost every part of of Tully's life. It, we, Paul and I always were kind of amused. There's almost like a zealot quality to, to Tully's life, where he, the most mundane thing he might be doing. He manages to meet somebody incredibly famous or is going to be incredibly famous. And, you know, one of our favorite stories is that when he's uh, sort of working as an itinerant tree surgeon and uh, he ends up in um, uh, Marion, Ohio, trimming the trees of the leading citizen, the, the local newspaper editor. And afterwards, the, uh, the editor ha invites them to drink bourbon on the porch as the sun is going down. Paul, who's he drinking bourbon with? Well, that would be Warren G. Harding. So uh, <laughs> Tully not aware that he was drinking with the future president of the United States and this future president of the United States completely unaware that he was d drinking with what would become 
a very famous writer in his day. So, yeah. and Tully was always had experiences of, of running into people and uh, somehow it, it being useful to him in some way. Right. So it's not just writers. Yes, he does seem to be knowing all the writers and having experience of different writers, but it's true in Hollywood. I mean, when he gets to Hollywood, he's not friendless. He is the most hated man in Hollywood because he is writing what he what he wants to and what he what he what he feels like writing. And he's also the most feared man in Hollywood because, as John Gilbert found out, he, you didn't register your complaints with him that you didn't like what he was writing. Uh, this was somebody who could take care of himself and was willing to take care of himself. But he had a lot of very, very close friends in Hollywood. One of his closest friends was W.C. Fields. You know, he was good friends with Frank Capra. He was very good friends with Jimmy Cagney, who played him on Broadway. Cagney's big break as an actor was when Tully's first bestseller, uh, Beggars of Life, which is about his road years. And when that was published, that was what allowed him to break away from Chaplin. He was finally able to make it as a writer. That book was very quickly turned into a Broadway show by Maxwell Anderson called Outside Looking In, and they needed a young actor to play the Tully character in the play. And the actor had to be Irish, had to be on the short side, and he had to have red hair. And Cagney, who was basically a song and dance man at the time, shows up in auditions and gets his big break as a dramatic actor playing Jim Tully. So they remain friends. So he, he's he's far from friendless in Hollywood, and he seems to know everybody. There's a point before he makes it, uh, even before he's working for Chaplin, where he's hanging around on Hollywood Boulevard with a group of friends, and one by one they're going to make it. They're all gonna they're all gonna break through. One of the people in the crowd is Lon Chaney. <laughs> is and, 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 and another one is a guy who's going to have to wait a really long time before he's going to be the last of the group to break through, and he's not going to break through until 1931. And it's Boris Karloff. So Tully always seems to be, no matter where he is in his life, no matter what he's doing, and so so maybe it's Charlie Makeley, one of the you know the the, the Dillinger gang. Maybe it's Warren G. Harding. Maybe it's Upton Sinclair or Jack London. Or maybe it's W.C. Fields or Charlie Chaplin. He, he, he's, he sees the parade of America before him. And yet the books that he's best known for is not about the famous people. The books he's best known for and the books that are really the heart of his literary legacy are about the American underclass. And when I, when I say the underclass, I mean, at that point, the people that America didn't want to recognize existed. So he's writing about hobos and railroad workers and prostitutes and boxers and a group of people who had had no voice before and not even were recognized as having existed. In a lot of ways, Jim Tully is, is Steinbeck before Steinbeck. He's, he's writing about the everyday Americans out there. He's Woody Guthrie before Woody Guthrie. He, 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 so it's it's these are the books, and starting with Beggars of Life, these are the books that really are the 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 foundation of his literary accomplishment. And he ultimately writes five books that he groups as what he called his underworld edition. Now he, he did not mean crime when he said underworld. He meant like the lower depths, like Gorky meant the lower depths. So uh, the five books were uh, Beggars of Life, which were about his years on the road, Circus Parade, which Paul and I agree is probably in the running as for his grittiest book about these awful small circuses in the South where he worked off and on while he was on the road, Shanty Irish, which is about his family, Shadows of Men, which uh, is about the grifters and drifters and con artists that he met while he was on the road. And this would be the other book that we would put in the running for his, his grittiest book. And then finally, Blood on the Moon, which was about his journey to becoming a writer, because it sort of begins in St. Mary's and it ends in Kent. So it's his journey to 
resolving to become a writer and sort of how he did it. These five books, he wrote 14 books overall, but these are the five books, and they're the five we had reprinted along with his boxing novel, The Bruiser, which many people think is the finest novel of the ring ever done because it was written by someone who actually knew what it was like to be inside the ring. It's, I want to just mention one thing about Shadows of Men, uh, which is really the book, um, they're, they're autobiographical, but this one specifically looks at men in jail and what how they got there. So he had been interested in prison. Uh, in 27, he visited uh, San Quentin to see uh, Tom Mooney, who was in prison for the 1916 San Francisco Preparedness Day bombing. J.B. McNamara, who was serving a life sentence for the 1910 bombing of the Los Angeles Times building, and a boxer, Kid McCoy, who had fallen on hard times and was also serving time. And it gave him the idea that he would do uh, an essay about the death penalty. So H.L. Mencken liked the idea and uh, wanted to publish it in the American Mercury. And the story of this particular condemned man is particularly interesting. It is something I think out of a James Cain story, there's a man named Earl Clark, the condemned man. He was convicted of killing a sailor who had been wooing Clark's girlfriend. Clark escaped from the Los Angeles County Jail, settled in South Dakota in a small town. He married, he began a painting business, and he had was had a sort of a, a routine, normal life. But things came undone. Uh, and this is what reminds me of a James Kane, you know, uh, noir story. There was a, a young man who had taken a mail order detective course, picked up Clark's trail and turned him in. So Tully went to witness the hanging and he wrote about it in a very objective fashion. It was just, it was a, a very cut and dried and which made the horror of what was going to be happening to this young man as he ascended the scaffold and was hanged even harder hitting. This piece was called A California Holiday, uh, and it, I think, is one of the greatest indictments against capital punishment ever written. Uh, in fact, uh, Ruby Darrow, Claro's wife, particularly singled it out for praise. So the California Holiday piece then was put at the tail end of um, Shadows of Men. So Shadows of Men is the book about Tully's time on the road amongst criminals, and at the back end of it is this later piece where he is an established writer and goes to cover the hanging of, uh, of Earl Clark. It's a it's a really a chilling piece, and uh, as is all of Shadows of Men. It's it, it's an amazing book. And as Mark said, along with Circus Parade, probably his hardest spoiled work: uh, Shadows of Men and, and Circus Parade. Wow. Speaking of criminals, um, back to Charles Makeley for a moment. Uh, Tully. In 1934, not only interviewed his old pal, Makeley, at the height of the Midwest bank robbing gangster era, but he also attempted to set an interview up with John Dillinger, who at the time was on the lam and on the front pages of every paper in the country. That That is correct. Uh Jim was, at least by his accounting, looking at a $100,000 payday if he could land an interview with Dillinger. So he had his friend Walter Winchell put this out over the air that Tully was looking for Dillinger and was looking to do an interview. Um, eventually, it was uh, Tully's attorney who sort of dumped cold water on this that he would be uh, open to harboring a fugitive since Dillinger was a wanted man. Um, we know that uh, both Harry Pierpont and, and Makeley came to a bad ends. Um, he and Pierpont fashioned uh, guns from bars of soap, got out of their cells. Uh, Makeley died in a hail of gunfire. Pierpont survived and then uh, ultimately died in Ohio's electric chair. Right. Tully had uh, numerous relationships with women through the course of his life. Would you Tell us about his marriages, the women he loved. Well, he was involved uh, in his younger life with a, a, a showgirl, Mary Ligo. Uh, she seemed to have broken his heart. Uh, he was involved with the librarian here in Kent, uh, Nellie Dingley. It was never really romantic. She encouraged his writing. He actually proposed to her. 
Uh, but she was not interested. They were from really different sides of the tracks. And I think perhaps in a, a bit of a rebound, he married a Kent uh, girl just out of high school. It was his first wife. He was married three times. Uh, his second wife, uh, Marna, was, it was, that was a very t- tempestuous relationship. Uh, the good thing that came out of his second marriage was uh, they traveled, uh, Tully did one travel book. And he and Marna traveled to Europe where they interviewed various people, saw some of the usual tourist spots. But the interviews really are memorable because he met and interviewed uh, James Joyce and H.G. Wells and others. And it's really a, a sort of a sweet, um, you wouldn't know that their marriage was falling apart. There's really a Nick and Nora Charles quality uh, to their relationship, at least as it comes across in the book. So that's one that is on our list. We would like to see that uh, reprinted, uh, Beggars Abroad. That's uh, the one travel book he did. Uh, His third marriage is the one that took, uh, and it lasted the rest of Tully's life. And uh, uh, she took very good care of Jim as his health failed later in life. You know, you asked about early on about the the research of this book and the writing of this book. I mean, one thing we did not say is um, it took us 19 years to research this book and write it. And one reason was there was no Rosetta Stone with Tully. There was so little, you know, if you start a a biography of, oh, let's say Edgar Allan Poe, uh, just to pick one writer, there's a huge scholarship built up. There's a huge amount of work that's already been done that you can access. There's there's paths you can follow. With Tully, there was nothing. There was there was very very little. And in essence, Paul and I had to get out our machetes and make the path uh, for this. So that was one reason it took us quite a while to do this. Another reason is that when you write a biography of anybody, you have to become an expert on. A lot of things you were never an expert on. Uh, If you were going to write about Mark Twain, you have to somewhat learn about what riverboat travel was like on the Mississippi, and you're going to become an expert about that. In the case of Jim Tully, we had to become experts on a staggering amount of topics. And I I, I just, it's, it's a darn good thing there were two of us because. We'd still be working on this book, I think, if it was just one. You, we had, you, you had to learn what, what, the, what was the world of boxing like in 1907 on the Ohio circuit when Jim Tully was, was actually working his way up the ranks as a boxer. What was that like? What was Hollywood like in the early 1920s? What was life on the road like? Um, we, Tully's life, is, he lived such a varied life and such a big life. And, uh, you know, writers often enough, they don't lead very interesting lives. Their, their lives are often enough spent behind uh, keyboards of some kind, a typewriter or, or, or parchment or, or today a computer. Tully lived a big life, which is every bit as good as any of his books. And in fact, he draws on his life to write most of his best books. And we, we really had to become experts on a lot of things. And even the littlest, tiniest thing that he might have encountered We had to do really deep dives on on these things in order to make it make sense in the course of his life. So um, that was where the division of labor really came in, came in handy for this, because we could turn to each other and say, all right, well, you handle that. And while I'm doing this, while I'm handling that. What is each of your favorite Tully books? Oh, you're going to get a different answer on this. I'll let Paul go first. I, I think uh, Circus Parade, uh, probably if I had to pick one, I mean, it was banned. Uh, <laughs> that's just, I, I suppose, icing on the cake. Um, it, it's so, if you if you know the, the movie Freaks, then that just, that's as close as I can come yes. to describing what Circus Parade is like. And it's just so out there. Um, yeah, it's, it's so many things that are just unforgettable. Uh, Circus Parade would be, I suppose, my choice. And, and mine would be Shandy Irish. It was the first. It was the, the the first one I read. It was the one that led me to fall in love with Tully's writing. Uh, so there's a great deal of affection for it from that standpoint. But there's also a very um, quiet man quality to that book. It, it's certainly probably the most affectionate 
of his books. Uh, there's a great deal of storytelling about the two family, his mother's family, the Lawlers, and his. Uh, I mean, the, the 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 book starts with this story about his aunt Mall trying to join the Methodist Church, doing the unthinkable thing of joining the the Methodists, and how his grandfather and his uncle went to rescue the pride of their family from the Methodists doing this unthinkable thing. And uh, it's, 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 it's depicted as this, like uh, this, this great crusade uh, in, in, in this, and they go in a buck a wagon to uh, this little Methodist church and they wade in among the Methodists and this big fight breaks out and they, they get Maul and they, they, they put her in the wagon and they are taking her home and as they're taking her home, Jim's grandfather, Lawler, turns to his son and says, Ah, Dennis, how proud I was of you today. Everywhere your fist fell, there fell a Methodist. Now, that's the spirit of that <laughs> book. And, and, and old Huey uh, is very much the star. His grandfather is very much the star of that book. So I, I have a great deal of affection for for that book. Each of the books is something special. Is really something special. And, and Circus Parade is really, he's really at the top of his game in, in Circus Parade, and I think Shadows of Men both. But uh, you didn't ask me which one I thought was his best. You said which is my favorite. So that for that, I'll say Shanty Irish. Okay, uh, which is his best? I'd have a hard time not saying Shadows of Men. Um, it, 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 it's awfully good. It really is. And it's, it is, uh, his depiction of the, the, the drug addicts and the con artists that he met on the road, uh, are so, is so gripping. He, he, he actually will tell you what, uh, somebody in the grips of, 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 of drug addiction is like, yeah, this is, yeah, you know, we're, we're talking about 1929, 1930 here. It's it's really quite an amazing book, um, and 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 to me, um, as good as uh, Beggars of Life is, as good as Shanty Irish is, I really think Shadows of Men may have been where he was at the peak of his of his skills. He was really in command of what he was doing in Shadows of Men, uh, and you can you could feel him getting better with each book, and that one really really pops. So my my I, I you really feel what it was like to be trapped in a in a boxcar with somebody in the grips of delusion caused by by drugs. Um, it's it is it's just amazing. You know, and and Paul alluded to something before, which is really very distinctive of Tully's writing and his personality. He's an extraordinarily non-judgmental writer. He never, Tully could very well have been the type of person who, who talked endlessly about all the people who victimized him in his life. Uh, he never did. He never, he just sort of said, well, this is the way they were. This is the way they had to be. This is the way life shaped them. And he's very, very fair about things. And he, 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 he is like the observer. He is, he, it, it, and it's the way he depicts them that is so gripping. Again, there's this hard-boiled way of writing, but there's also this kind of deep understanding and not just understanding of human nature and acceptance of it. He, there's this tremendous acceptance of, you know, people are people, and that's al not always very attractive. So I'm just going to present them as they are and as I knew, and as I knew them. And that's one of the things that gives his his writing so much power. Wow! Yeah. How how did he die? Well, Paul, his, do you want to take this? Yeah, his his health started to decline. Um, and what what one of the things that I think um, after really after we had done the book, and I had time to think about and reflect, is uh, that was so interesting to me was um, we live in a celebrity culture, and I think that was certainly true on Tolly's day and where things sort of came together for him as a writer, things began to come undone. And so Jim wanted to write his way back and he was becoming, he, I think he sensed he was, he was disappearing from the scene. So he actually had a book contract with Scribner's. His uh, editor was Maxwell Perkins. I mean, you, things were set up 
this should have succeeded, and the book was Biddy Brogan's Boy. Unfortunately, Tully's name was a little old at that point, and there was a new writer on the scene, and her book came out. Uh, the book was um, Cross Creek, which was her follow-up to her Pulitzer Prize-winning book. This was Marjorie Rawlings. And everybody wanted to read the new Marjorie Rawlings. Nobody really cared much about Tully's Biddy Brogan's Boy. And that, I think, was his last serious attempt. His health gradually grew, grew into decline, and he had a, a, a fairly sad end. He ended up in a, um, a nursing home in California where down the hall was W.C. Field. So these two guys who had nearly crossed paths in Kent, Ohio, decades before, had been friends in Hollywood and now uh, at the end of their lives uh, in a nursing home in California. And, uh, and then Tully died in 47. Yeah, and, and he's only 61 when he dies, and he looks uh, a good 10 years older when he dies. They were hard he, years. Yeah, they, his hair has gone white. He, when he was writing Biddy Brogan's Boy, he suffered a massive heart attack. And it, this is really kind of the beginning of the end, because then he has heart trouble, he has circulation problems, he has arthritis, he has rheumatism. He's bedridden uh, for a good deal the last couple of years, and he cannot marshal the forces to write anymore. And this is also World War II, where everything goes into eclipse. The, the, the publishing industry goes into eclipse. Everybody's saving paper for the, for the war effort, and they're doing paperbacks for the soldiers. And, um, you know, T Tully, by the time he dies, is already starting to be forgotten. And after the, the, by the time you get into the 1950s, see, Tully's reputation is really going, going, gone. And, and certainly by the 1960s, he's very, very few people knew, know who Jim Tully is by then. There's still some, you know, uh, a young actor, Robert Mitchum, goes, strikes out and, and leaves behind a copy of one of Tully's books behind when he when he leaves. You know, uh, uh, Harlan Ellison uh, idolized Jim Tully uh, as a young writer, you know. So there's some people who remember the name and um, and did it. But by the time Paul and I were, starting this very very few people would have just just as as paul and i did not recognize the name uh very few other people would have actually known the name jim telly so once readers finish uh your biography of, of jim tully what would you recommend they read first beggars of of life well that that was his breakthrough book so that's always a good place to start and it's a good general overview of the sort of work he would be doing um, Shanty Irish, as Marcus said, uh, is, um, his warmest book, his most affectionate book. He's writing about his family before everything, uh, went bad with the death of his mother. So that's certainly a good place to begin. Um, if you feel like just jumping right into it, Circus Parade or Shadows of Men, those are, those are both brutal books and, uh, unforgettable. So I, I, I don't have just one place, I guess, to start. I would, I suppose uh, depend on uh, what the reader feels like uh, tackling. And, and, I, and, and I would say, you know, Beggars of Life is not a bad starting point because it is his starting point about breaking away from from St. Mary. That's where it begins. It begins with a conversation with a young hobo uh, on a train trestle in St. Mary's, Ohio. And so it is about this kind of the, this, this breaking away and this beginning of these road years. And uh, it's not a bad place to start. Well, this has been so great. I appreciate both of you arranging your schedules so we could all talk together. Thank you both for your time. Well, it was certainly our pleasure. And uh, and again, if anybody is interested in, in discovering uh, Jim Tully, uh, we have reprinted six of his books, the five uh, Underworld books we talked about and The Bruiser, the boxing novel. And uh, you don't have to go tracking down very expensive editions from the 1920s. They're all there. And uh, this is definitely a writer who should be rediscovered, and he's sitting there waiting to be rediscovered. Thank you so much, Eric. I, I really uh, love Most Notorious and uh, keep up the good work. It's, it's really terrific. So before we go, I wanted to add that I did include a link in the show notes for Paul Bauer's online bookstore, which is called Archers Used in Rare Books. He specializes in true crime, baseball, botany, literature, music, and books about Ohio. He has some wonderful stuff available for purchase. 
I've also included a link to Mark DeWidziak's website, markdewidziak.com, where you can learn all about the books he's written, co-written, and edited. Everything from Mark Twain to Columbo to The Twilight Zone to Edgar Allan Poe to Jim Tully, of course. Again, I have been speaking to Mark DeWidziak and Paul Bauer. They are the authors of Jim Tully, American writer, Irish rover, Hollywood brawler. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.